Ho, ho, ho. Ho, hey ho, there. ho. <laughs> we are here and excited. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holiday, Jason. <laughs> yeah, man, nice sweater. I like it. It's really Thank you very much. It's really it's perfect. Really, I got this sweater for the holiday. I yeah, it's it beautiful. Be the most appropriate sweater to wear for an occasion like this one. I think we might maybe we should have talked before today, you know, like that we didn't wear the same thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. That I hate when uh, that happens, <laughs> that you end up wearing the same thing. <laughs> but how is everybody doing? Hi, guys. Leave us a little message. Let us know if you can hear us, if the audio is correct. I apologize for my yelling. I'm Italian. <laughs> so you're about to experience a very Italian Christmas. Yes, see, I've Are been... You, do I've you see the comments? Is everything Yeah, okay? everything looks beautiful. I guess everyone can hear us fine. And, uh, we kind of figured out how to do things. We, we might are in my <laughs> living room at the moment. I live in a castle. Um, yeah, this is our chimney because it's very cold. And there's a fire in there. <laughs> yeah, it's very, yeah, it's nice. It's and warm. really hot. So I it's think a real chimney. Like... Yeah, this this <laughs> is this is not <laughs> wait <laughs> hold on it can fall <laughs> this is part of the decoration yeah um yeah somebody just asked where you can get the sweaters i don't know maybe that's going to be something you can maybe get maybe in it, the future i have to be honest they weren't as cheap as i thought they would be you know <laughs> actually so and also like i'm dripping sweat underneath <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway they're 100 percent plastic <laughs> <laughs> They're made with recycled material, <laughs> all of it. But on the other hand, we are doing the proper ventilation in this room. Uh, we are doing it and also social distancing. Yes. You don't um, see it because it's transparent, but there is a, a sheet of plexiglass in between. <laughs> yes. You see? Anyway. Um, all right. So Jason, Fabio, people yeah, are here yeah. to listen professional stock not you and i yeah but I, I also wanted to say though first before we start uh, to say thank you uh, for everyone for joining us um we uh did we're watching you know uh, the things that were taking place recently with the state of the art academy and we were happy to join in there um yes uh, to take part congratulations to you guys yes. for a beautiful show congratulations i see roberto actually in the comments so that's nice uh, to, to have him here How, hello roberto um I just wanted to say that uh, that if you still can, you are still able to uh, donate to the Red Cross. Uh, so do that if you can. Um, and we had been planning to do this uh, Christmas, or let's not say Christmas, let's say holiday uh, special for a long time. And um, it's our gift to you, to the community. It's only going to be speakers. There's not going. We did not have any sponsors for this uh, on purpose. That we wanted this to be our gift. So sit back community. and enjoy yes. and uh yeah fabio let's uh should we announce yeah, the I first speaker are you ready to cue the video should we We're unmute ready ourselves to go. with them guys ladies and gentlemen it is with great pleasure to announce that we have tonight with us the guys from assembly assembly studio hey guys Woohoo! hello yeah we you know, we're good. We were talking for the past three hours. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you know how stressful that was. But anyway, are you guys ready for a beautiful presentation? Everybody at home cannot wait to see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Jason, should we give them the control of our? Yeah, let's do that. Everything's a little complicated. There's a lot you can't you we actually were able to properly block out all the wiring uh, so nobody can see that. But there's a lot of stuff here on the desk. <laughs> um, let me just get it. Sorry, I don't want to be too. I don't want to show you the wrong thing. <laughs> here we go. Share. And let's mute ourselves. No, this will mute. No, hold on. Sorry, there, there. You guys' audio was missing at the moment, but we have it now. It's all, okay. all good to go. Sorry, I just uh, realized that. Okay, I'm gonna mute us and give you control. Okay, if there's any problems, yeah. you just let us. 
If there's any problems, just uh, let us know, okay? We'll be here. Hello everyone, we are Assembly, so glad to be here tonight and represent our company, my colleagues Jada and Martin and of course me, Monica, are going to show the poster of the new Assembly Tour. By the way, we will mention quite a lot of software brands during the presentation, but we are not affiliated with them in any way. Hope you will enjoy and let's begin. Uh, for those that didn't hear about Assembly Studios before, uh, Assembly Studios were originally formed in 2000 under a different name, Smooth. The company was set up by two architects and a video director with a purpose of creating architectural visualizations to help fund the development of the architecture practice. Uh, and this worked well, both uh, com companies grew and Assembly become one of the major players within the London uh, ArcGIS community. And then after both uh, companies developed, there was a natural separation in around 2008. Um, assembly then, re um, Smooth then rebranded to Assembly and they opened the studio in Abu Dhabi and opened their offer to cover all things design, uh, and digital alongside the traditional CGI offering. Um, Assembly now combines in-house disciplines together with specialist partners and creates interactive and immersive experiences that bring architecture and uh, unbuilt spaces to life. And we work across the UK, Europe, Middle East and Russia. After hearing uh, the story of Assembly, uh, now I think it's time to introduce ourselves too. So my name is Monica and I'm from Lithuania. In 2008, when Assembly was formed, I was still in high school, uh, wondering what to do with my life. And 2010 was uh, the year when I started my four year engineering architecture degree. Uh, the time flew really fast uh, and I was ready to start my career, or at least I thought I was. The first job turned out to be really intense emotionally, uh, full of stress and overtime. If I could go back to in time to myself, to me young, um, I would like to say to have a respect to myself. It's just not worth to suffer and in the end you are the, the one who lose. After a while I left that office, uh, found the other job and I started my new bachelor degree of architecture in Vilnius Academy of Art. Uh, studies and job was tough to handle, but that's my uh, possible mission. The only one thing, uh, juggling between these two led me straight into uh, burnout. When I look back uh, to my work life, it looks like a musing uh, roller coaster. And I know this happened because it just simply didn't fit me. The life of architect wasn't for me. Um, after eight years of studying and working as architect, I decided to do something else, uh, something different. Um, thankfully, CG art still cost my life back. Uh, I packed my bags, uh, took my laptop, and started to live the freelance dream life, working while traveling for internships and uh, on the other side of the world. Um, after a year being abroad, I was ready to come back uh, and look for a team to work with. Uh, I've been pretty lucky to meet other Lithuanian girl who used to work here um, in assembly. After her stories, how great this company was and is, I was really, really tempted to, to write to them. And here I am, a member of assembly. 
Hi, I'm Giada, I'm Italian, I'm from Chieti, that is a pretty unknown town in the center of Italy. I like pizza, pizza, as you can see from the picture. I'm loud and noisy, and I can't explain a concept without using my hands. So basically, you can describe me pretty much uh, with all the Italian stereotypes. In 2008, um, I was an IP teenager who was starting architectural university full of dreams and hope to have a successful future ahead as an architect. What a foolish. Because I spent five sleepless years to get that architectural master degree uh, just to become a successful, unpaid, talented intern in an architectural practice. In Italy, you're used to be paid in experience, and back then I just thought it was an experience enough to receive a salary. So I needed to do something to compensate that. And uh, another master sounded like a good idea. Knowing that being an architect wasn't really my thing, I felt a bit lost. Since one day, looking at some uh, website for architectural references, uh, an advertiser invited me to join the Master in Digital Architecture at UAB in Venice. And I thought, uh, what is this a crazy idea? Do you mean that modeling and rendering could be a real job and I shouldn't do it for free? So this was absolutely mind blowing. In two days, I decided that I want to become a CD artist. So I applied for the MADI in Venice, I got in, and here I am now. I graduated in 2016, I moved to London with the MADI internship, and now I'm here at Assembly, working in this amazing office with amazing people, uh, happy about my job and proud about my journey. Hi all, my name is Martin, this is the way you spell it, not Martin, even though I don't mind. <laughs> Everybody calls me Martin anyway. I was born in the 80s in Portugal, in a seaside town called Davao. I graduated in architecture in 2007 from the Porto School of Architecture, where I also started to develop a taste for three-dimensional representation during the last years of the course. And I actually have done my first paid jobs there, doing some of my colleagues' final presentations. And then after the graduation, I worked as an architect for three years in Portugal. And then around 2010, the economical crisis in Portugal was in full force, and archives actually seemed much, much better shape than architecture. So I took a full archives course in a big Portuguese CGI company and just ended up staying there for the next five years as a CGI I ever since done a postgrad in digital architecture and parametric design from University of London, uh, Lisbon, sorry, <laughs> and, well, and developed a particular interest in film photography and uh, digital videography that I still nurture and develop today. And then around 2016, I applied to work at Assembly, where I still am progressing from midway artist to senior, and then collaborating and leading major projects. So I'm sure our personal stories are pretty much similar to many of the foreigners that work in London in ArcViz. So what we think makes Assembly special is the way we work together. Our work ethic is based on three points that are uh, reliability, dedication, and cooperation. And we don't apply them only with our clients, but we follow them within each other. So it's very important for us to cooperate as much as we can. We constantly share our work. We have daily reviews about every step of the process of producing an image. And also organizing review with your colleagues is really helpful to have a second opinion on our ideas, and especially to see what our eyes sometimes simply cannot see it. Because if you spend too much time on the same image, you're becoming kind of blind, let's say. And also, they are really helpful to push each other to do better every day. So I think having a stimulating environment is the key for creating a great work. And uh, if you don't have the fear of criticism, that could actually happen. Uh, sharing your work is the way to enhance your creativity. But we, uh, who are those um, amazing people that we're talking about? So assembly team, as you can see, is a very multicultural environment. We have many Italians, of course, and, uh, but we have also many women. 
maybe too many Italians? No, it's never too many. <laughs> Something that we know is, uh, is quite unusual for our industry because the 70, over the 70% of our CG artists are women and is quite a big number compared to the 7% of the food industry. Um, the secret of our success is also the team building. So we love to work in the office, but also we love to have fun together. We always find any occasion to enjoy the time we spend in the office. We celebrate Diwali, we dress up for Halloween. That is also an excuse to have great spooky photo shoots. We attended the main events of our this community, even if this year is been possible only online. And we also love to spend some time together outside work. Uh, we used to have a weekend Christmas party abroad. Uh, we've been to Poland and Germany in the past two years, and it's been so much fun. So we're going to miss it a lot this Christmas. But let's stop being sad about this Christmas to come, and let's focus on our work. So today, we'd like to share with you guys a bit of our workflow. Some people who have been working in the industry for many years uh, might find it quite obvious. And I'm sure there are many people who are just starting uh, their career in art biz. They could find uh, at least this inspirational, we hope. Or, and maybe it will demystify this profession a bit. So we're going to show you guys uh, one of our workshops. Because besides our commission project, we run three months workshop where we can explore more unconventional images and exer experiment uh, with new technique and new plugins. One of our latest workshops uh, was focused on the lighting of the Chapel of Reconciliation in Berlin. And uh, as well as per every project, uh, our creative process starts from our observation and inspiration of the time. Photography and movies are probably the biggest sources of inspiration. They represent the reality. So they give you an idea of how light and materials should work in real life. Sometimes it's the architecture itself that could inspire you with its design, uh, its shape, its um, ways to drive the light into the spaces. And also other companies render are very inspirational. There are so many exceptional CG studios that we can take as examples. And when you look at such amazing works we can produce in 3D, for sure you will feel pushed to do better every day. Um, after collecting references, we start working on composition. The composition of an image is very important, and it usually starts with a preliminary study to understand the space. That, uh, then it follows up experimenting with different types of cameras and different angles. And then, together with the camera angles, we need to start working on the lighting and mutually progress to find the perfect shots. In this phase, we usually uh, work in clay, so we put chalk materials for the geometry, and only the lighting uh, is bringing color to the scene. Here are some of the images produced for the workshop. Uh, our main focus has been to use the light functionally to reinterpret the space in our personal way. Some people chose to work on an interior scene, some exteriors, but all of them integrated the artificial and natural light, exploring more unconventional ways uh, of showing the space, far from what we usually uh, what usually clients ask us to do. So lighting and composition are probably the most important step for making good image, because if they work well, every other next step will be easier and it will lead to a great final result. So after a deep study of compositions, uh, the, <laughs> the modeling part is, Como Row was the project in Birmingham, which our company finished in 2013. So why is it still relevant today? Uh, back then, we weren't able to get to the site, uh, to get to, the, to go to the site and take three, six day photography. And of course, everything had to be done really quickly. The best option that suited us was to model all of the surroundings, uh, from detailed street furniture to the detailed cornices of the roofs. It might sound like a, a long and less, less online, uh, annoying procedure, but with the help of our team members, modeling part goes really fast. The important thing uh, was to make everything detailed as in reality. For this, we had to use Google Street Views and Google Earth um, as the reference source. 
the workflow of modeling was pretty simple. Uh, spline modeling was our main technique, and when necessary to further detail, we used a default. For particular and more complicated details, we have pre-made models and adapted them if needed. In these VRs, you can see the hard work of the team. Everything is so detailed and accurate. If you think, there are many benefits in having all seen in 3D. Um, like for example, uh, you have not you are not attached to, to the particular camera camera location because before doing 360, we have to make sure where the camera position is going to be. And later you wouldn't have any freedom in changing it. So in Comoro project, the camera was free to move everywhere. The other challenging project uh, to model was Solar Lake Master Plan. As you can see, uh, this is a massive site, which was all made in 3D. To make this project happen and not to destroy our PC uh, and our souls, <laughs> we have to optimize optimize as much as possible. What this optimization meant to us, important rule number one, resizing texture. The biggest texture in the scene shouldn't be over one megabyte. The best would be to keep it around 500 kilobytes. For this, we use the uh, bitmap tracking plugin for pixels. The second important rule, keep materials as simple as possible without unnecessary maps. Third rule, keep the model elements simple in this case, not to use any single grass blades, uh, only collapsed in two meters square patches. To scatter all the elements, we use forest pack uh, and rail clone. Uh, forest pack was mainly for scattering the vegetation while working on the master plan. Uh, well, uh, well, um, while working on the master plan was um, uh, important to set the correct density uh, and the scale of the scattering, which had to be based on the distance from the camera. With rainfall, we scattered uh, these lovely cottages, which were made as meshes to keep our steam light and simple. It's really important to keep everything tidy. It might all take a lot of time at the beginning, but in the end, when everything will go smoothly, without any crashes, you'll be thankful for the time you dedicated at the very start of the model. So when the full CG way is not possible, for, for example, when the time to get the 3D parts working is not worth it, or simply when the results would be better using 2D resources, the best way to involve, uh, the best way to proceed is to involve matte painting into the process to make a great image out of an aerial. We like to feel free to use an, any technique, and we also like to feel as free as possible to follow our creative creativity and our own style, even if it requires a more 2D approach or a 3D one. The key part of the process is the post-production. So once you worked in 3D to have a good base raw render, the main work will take place in Photoshop. One of the most important points we should care about when working on a Photoshop file is the organization. In our office, we always help each other. So it could happen that someone else will need to update your Photoshop file and to not drive them crazy, having a clear structure is strictly necessary. So this should relate especially to the compositing part of the matte painting uh, with a good organization into levels for the, from the foreground to the background, uh, renaming correctly all the layers and group. And then besides the organization of the file, I think there's no right or wrong in the process you adopt for post-production or the effects and technique you want to use. I personally think that there isn't a mechanical process we can apply for post-producing an image. It's up to your creativity and imagination, so be inspired by the image itself and the results you're aiming to reach. For the approach we adopted in the specific case of this aerial view of uh, SHA Villa's master plan in Abu Dhabi, we first work on the base render with all the adjustments and final retouches we need using the render elements or so traditional approach. Then we worked on the compositing of the 2D resources, uh, trying to blend them together in the best way possible. And then at the final end, we worked on the integration uh, between the 2D layers and the 3D render that was on the base. Uh, putting also some final effect to bring uh, atmosphere to the image. So you can see that uh, between the raw render um, 
and the final image, there is quite a difference. And the results could have been possible in this case, uh, and in a quick and efficient way, only thanks to the 2D matte painting approach we chose. So what makes an exterior image powerful and successful? Nowadays, we are balancing between marketing standards and ours as artists' vision. Sometimes the clients um, and us are sharing completely different ideas and finding a careful balance between the two can be a challenge. For example, many of them are tend to ask to see images with the biggest capacity as possible. In this case, a compromise is an inevitable part of any CG artist client relationship. As Jada said earlier, a good composition is the key to a successful image. You can see this in London Dog Master Plan Project, which is located in Wapping. Uh, when the compositions are ready, then is the time for the site photography. It's either drone, helicopter, or eye level, and it has to be done responsibly. With unpredictable weather conditions, we take, uh, sometimes we wait and, and wait uh, and wait no longer uh, to get great shots. But when the perfect light is there, we are out there too. After taking the photographs following war begins, we are preparing images by cleaning unnecessary info, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, power frames. A lot. Uh, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Everywhere. Red frames everywhere. Sometimes happens with the evening shots that the lights in the buildings are not bright enough, or maybe there are, there is something way too bright. Then we have to fix it in Photoshop. All these little changes have been done only to get a strong impression in the visuals. Even though uh, it's a still image, we have to create the storyline. We think uh, in this case, storytelling is an art, and everything should be about the immersion, where it immerses the viewer with the feelings that artisan feel. If we were, if we are able to achieve that, then this is our successful image, which is ready for the marketing purposes. While drone photography is used for exterior stills, as we just saw Monica was saying, sixty photography is often used for VR images. And 360 images are a great tool for our clients as they are a way of having a more immersive experience, the project, without having to recur to a more perhaps complex and expensive real-time model. Uh, they are also more versatile tools, as you can use them easily in different mediums. Creating, creating these images depends a slightly different approach than a still, given we see the full field of view from our camera. And there are situations, however, that we can make good use of the 300 photo and integrate our scenes seamlessly in it, as the example in the example you are you are, right, are seeing. And this is an office building uh, being built in Canary Wharf that we worked last year. For this background photography, we use the Panono camera. Here's Java using it uh, <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> uh, it's a 360-degree it's a camera with 108 megapixels and a quite high dynamic range, which allows a pretty sharp and high-resolution photography, even in low light conditions as, as the one we have in our example. Um, even though for the less experienced eye, a 360 photo integration might seem daunting or less obvious than just integrating a still image. We actually find it more straightforward even there are less variables to consider. For example, there's no respective lines or camera focal length to worry about. So to integrate the CGI scene in the 360 photo, one has to take in consideration just a few steps, making sure the camera position and height matches accurately between the 3D part and the uh, photo, and uh, as well as the respective light, light direction and time of day, of course, as uh, any photo integration. And then we just have to map the scene into a spherical photo that that was taken, whether using it as an environment or mapping it in a sphere with a center line with our camera. Other factors to consider might be cleaning your background photography of things that might appear behind your CG elements, or other issues created by 
the inaccuracies of the 3D model or the project morphology. Another completely set of challenges present themselves in when doing interiors. Um, one of which is that interior images are often done alongside the dreaded interior designers. And yes, they look and sound um, harmless and polite, but they produce things like this. Markups that nobody likes. And they especially have comments like this, <laughs> which, which let's say it's a good challenge to manage all this in our line of work. However, sometimes this is not the case. And we are expected to help young clients to convey the spaces that they want to sell. So in the tragic absence of the interior designer, we produce our own results. Um, for the expiring Ashley's artist that comes to the industry, and with all the tech skills and with all the tutorials watched and the latest rendering master, nothing prepares them for things like, at least nothing prepared me, for things like handling client expectations, interior designers, or mood board creation. Creating a mood board is therefore, at least in our or in my experience, an acquired skill. And even though some people can arguably be more prone to do a good job out of the bat, it's a challenge. And the challenge is understanding the client's needs, mixing it with the desire of keeping an artistic progression of the space, and the technical aspect of actually finding assets versus modeling them as we want the client to be happy, but also want to be accurate and as time aware as we can be. After all, time is also critical in our line, line of work. And, and with, within doing interiors, with the help of mood boards, also teaches us how to adapt to someone else's vision while adding your own personal imprint with your own sense of artistry, but also as a CD artist that understands composition, colors, asset placement, and so we believe that activity is the key. So uh, in our office, we produce not only still images, but also VRs, as we saw for the exteriors. But for an interior VR, um, there are completely different challenges. And most of the time, uh, it, we require a full CG approach. The space might be not fully clear for taking a 360 photos and then photo match it, like we did for the exterior VR that Martin, Martin showed. Um, or simply the space doesn't exist yet in reality, so we need to build it fully in 3D. So in this case, the challenges are different and we need to concentrate mainly on textures, materials, and mapping. So for the Pennington Street warehouse uh, in Wapping, the main focus has been to replicate the future space of the warehouse as real as possible with a big attention to the grip work. To get, to get this result, we decided that using real photography of the space would have been the best way. So we went on site, uh, we took pictures of the original samples, and we made our own textures for the brick walls, columns, arches, concrete, and other small details, as you can see. Then after the textures are ready, making a good material is pretty easy, and we didn't build any crazily complex material. And after having texture and materials ready, we moved to mapping the space. And because of the complexity of the arches, we decided to unbrack it to be sure to obtain the best result. We used a very simple way of making the texture. So we straightened the picture. Uh, we took the sample that would be useful for making the texture. Uh, we made the, the sample wider. We removed the repetition, and we made it seamless. Uh, everything has been done in Photoshop, so even the, the, from the diffuse map, we extracted bump reflection and normals. And uh, for this project, but for many other projects, clients ask for having both the space empty uh, and the space as an office. Uh, whose fit out has been designed by us, like many times. So VRs are, in this case, a really powerful uh, marketing tool because thanks to them, you can have an immersive experience into the space and you can understand its real dimension. And it's been a really key point here. For uh, usually the empty VRs are showing the space as developer will give it to the fusion landlord. 
And so in this case, it was really important to be see, to see the cut through that was connecting all the levels because it doesn't exist right now. And the fitted version um, is usually as the function of showing the real size of the office and its user capacity with an idea of the design of the furniture that we did, but it might change even in the future. So after the standard set of images we've been looking at, uh, vignettes are sometimes done uh, as a way to enhance the project's understanding by adding a more human scale. By zooming in in certain details, you get a sense of proximity and identification that you really don't have on the standard wider set of images. As you can see here on this example, the right image is part of the standard set of interiors, and it serves a very different purpose than a vignette. Vignettes on the left side, by introducing things like dishes on the sink or little droplets of water or dearranged assets, gives your brain uh, a different cue, or more familiar one, maybe. Um, in this other example, for example, the, the, the careful placement of assets like the sleepers on the floor, the charging phone on the table, the books, gives also a, a viewer a different cues and maybe a sense of proximity and familiarity. And for example, in this office space, the vignette also offers the opportunity to place the brands, uh, branding placement, and again, the slightly rearranged objects like the spoon mark uh, brings a lot uh, to the whole sense of space. Vignettes also happen to be a set of images that we like to do uh, because normally they are done at the end of the process, we are a bit less pressured, and also gives the CGI artist the, ex the opportunity to explore realism in a in a in our workflow in, in a more focused way, and this makes the creation of vignettes a combined process and a sensitive choice of composition, assets, lights, and materials, with the technicality of producing beautiful and realistic depth of field, for example, or adding lens effects when when applicable. So, all this that we've been um, watching. It's um, part of the core work of assembly. So still images, VR, interactive uh, presentations as well that we're going to speak uh, further in the presentation. However, we also produce animation work when the opportunity presents. For example, this year, we were asked to produce a small reel for the launcher of our new website. Uh, and animation brings yet another dimension to the story. Adding movement is another great, great way to, to bring immersivity to our scenes. And I invite you to watch the next clip with headphones if you have it, or at least good sound if possible. There's a few things I would like to point out 
that we took in consideration while doing this clip. First point is camera movement. As you can tell by the clip that's uh, going right now, the camera movements are purposefully slow and smooth. Uh, and when animating the camera, one has to understand what's being conveyed. And in this case, we wanted to give time to the spectator to absorb the scene. In other cases, you might want to introduce a more organic movement to your camera, like in the swimming pool detailed scene, where a subtle cam camera shape was introduced, making it, making it as if someone is inside the water holding a camera. Another aspect of camera movement is thinking about the path of the cameras and trying to sequence them in a non-linear way. For example, if you have a scene panning left, you might want the next scene to zoom in or then pan up, creating variety and avoiding repetition of movement and therefore adding the chance of keeping the spectator's interest. Second, I would like to mention is the addition of animated elements. In most cases, besides the camera movements, there is one or more elements that are also animated, introducing another dynamic layer and realism to what's being watched. For example, the organic assets like the water and the vegetation are always good resources to animate, as our brains are expecting them to move. Other elements like curtains and the use of depth of fields are also considered, uh, sometimes referring to external plugins when, when necessary. In this case, it was uh, marvelous design. Um, and all these elements working together hopefully will keep the spectator attention busy and stimulated and provide a very better experience. The final aspect I would like to point out is sound design. And next will be a clip with different layers of sound design. The first one with all the music, the second one with just the effect sounds, and the third one, the ambient sounds, and the final one without anything but these elements just for us to see um, the difference. So as you could hear, maybe, if the internet permits, <laughs> <laughs> the, the background music is an important aspect of what we are trying to convey, but also the introduction of key sounds that might enhance the scene and bring it to life even more, it's very, very important. The sound levels are particularly important when editing the sound, because it can quickly become a distracting element rather than an, an element. So, I don't know if I mentioned before, but Assembly has three different teams. Uh, there is the CG team, the design team, and the digital team. For a big project like the Mayfield Master Plan in Manchester, we collaborate all together to offer to our clients a full pack of tools involving not only CGI and VRs, but also an immersive experience, including the blueprint model and the interactive presentation. So, to be able to really experience the sides of Mayfield, CGI's and VR's are not enough. So, our digital team built in-house the blueprint of the whole master plan. The blueprint is an interactive model that includes all the media content into one single platform. It's fully interactive and it's a really interesting tool that could help uh, your immersion into the project and the communication that the client needs with the investors. In a, a blueprint, you can navigate inside the platform, exploring the building and the floor plans, but you can also experience uh, um, all the connections uh, there are with the master plans. So like, for example, the transport links nearby the site. You can also have a look at the gallery where you find all the images that uh, we produce, in this case from exteriors, showing the whole park or areas, till the interiors, that we developed for marketing two of the office building of the master plan. And then there is also in the same platform, um, um, a 364 that you can have access for, it's directly into the platform where there are all the VR that we produce for the project. 
And um, in collaboration with the design team, uh, we also produced an interactive presentation that brings all the content together with also the blueprint, creating a virtual marketing suite. It includes not only the CGI that we produce, but also an interactive floor plan where you can have direct access to all of the information of the single building. And it's being installed on site in Manchester onto a big three by three meter screens. And the screens are touched, so you can use gesture control to enlarge the pages to display multiple features at the same time and also to slide through the images. So in addition to interactive services and for part of them. Assembly has been using a real engine for the last couple of years commercially, having produced a few interactive models with great reception from the clients. Real-time models have been in high demand in the last years, pushing us artists and studios to develop their knowledge on these. And the, the advantages are obvious and the applicability to the artist industry is huge. Uh, we are all very familiar and in awe with the incredible photorealistic examples that we see online of real-time Archie's uh, uh, projects. However, we also know that these projects normally are done in uh, context of not a production pipeline, maybe as a demo or maybe in a small space with a very different set of restraints. So we notice there's a still a quality gap between real-time models and animated pre-rendered images. However, we also see this problem, this challenge being narrowed very fast and soon achievable in a, a production context. In the next project that I'm going to show, uh, and that we are going to show you, uh, we use for the first time the ray trace solution for the final animation. And we did see a significant improvement on the final result. As you, as you can see now, you can see significant changes and uh, differences in, in both uh, media. And real time seems to be here to stay. And we did see an obvious interest, and we do see an obvious interest from our end clients. However, we also think the good old still image doesn't seem to be going anywhere, too. So, so sometimes we tend to think the new kid on the block of Archie's comes to steal the show. But in reality, it's just another tool that the end clients will make sure to use and to monetize their projects in different ways. Real-time models still have the inconvenience of having a potent physical medium to run, even though running it you know, on a browser is also coming. Uh, but they are still less versatile and not as intuitive to use as us, the avid computer users, tend to think. We recently rebranded our uh, website and social media. So have a look at the new website, uh, where of course you can find all the information about us. Um, in the social, in the website, you also have a project session with the real of all of our most recent and successful works from all the teams. So CG, design, and digital, and. If you want to, you can also explore them into details by clicking into it. And you can have access to all of the content that we've been producing for the project. But also, if you want to know a bit more about us and what we do in and outside the studios, there's a culture section and uh, where you find all of our workshops, uh, our office trips, our initiatives, and everything else that uh, we'd like to share with you guys. So that's it. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we're happy, we're really happy to have been able to share our experience with you guys. So for the last part of our presentation, I would like to ask, uh, where is the secret of the good team work life? Is in respect of your team members, pushing, pushing each other to progress and do better than we did yesterday? to look back to our mistakes and learn something new out of it. And of course, nothing will be done without positive vibe in the company. So just have fun, enjoy, and embrace this adventure. Woohoo! Yeah, we would like to thank the V2 team and Fabio and Jason for contacting us to do this talk. And hopefully you got to know us a bit better. 
in our work process. And we look forward to see you in person when time permits. <laughs> so I hope I hope you guys can hear us. Yes. yes. I hope the people from home can hear us. Did I unmute everything? Yeah, it looks like everything's great. All right. So first of all, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> great presentation, guys. Thanks Thank a lot you. for uh, for doing this on uh, relatively you. short notice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we tried. <laughs> also, like the testing and uh, making sure that everything was okay. It yeah, was yeah. done on short notice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, well. it's okay. You know, karma is getting back at us. These yeah. uh, jumpers are made of plastic, so every time that I touch stuff, <laughs> I get electrocuted. And <laughs> we have oh a carpet God. on the floor, so, you know, it's like I'm electrostatic. Nice. Yeah, constantly. Let's see if there are any questions from home. Yeah. Um, I want to ask those who are watching if there are any questions. I do have a question for you guys. How do you manage to integrate any research and development that you do in your company being such a busy company? Oh. Yes, yeah, a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess I guess the the more important the most important thing is being enthusiastic about it and to have the will to do it because you know, we, we can fit all sorts of things like browsing in Amazon for new stuff or, you know, instead of doing that, maybe we are doing a bit of our workshops. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if we are enthusiastic about what you're doing and you believe that what you're doing is actually going to improve your work or, you know, improve the spirit of the team, it's, it's actually, we can make it happen. Of course, if we are enthusiastic about it, we're sometimes going to go home and work on it as well. That's so, you know, it's, it's, it's all about keeping the team uh, interested in what we are doing and come up with good ideas. And Monica has been the main... Uh, uh, she's in charge of the workshop. She's in charge of the workshop. She's the at the beginning of the uh, lockdown, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was like, oh, let's do something more. <laughs> something more. Very good. Well, because Some... we thought that maybe it was like, yeah. we're going to get uh, less job and we would be quiet. Yeah. So oh, let's keep up, yeah. let's keep That's something to do. Up. And, and then it ended up doing like both. And, yeah. it was and now, now, we, now we already third, third workshop. Third workshop. Yeah. We're going to finish by in January, I think. And then next one, and we have it all lined up. Like everyone wants to do something. So it's for the next year we have a, a plan. And of course, of course there are moments that people don't feel like doing it or, yeah. you know, but then Monica. <laughs> so <laughs> so Monica, the next question is, how do you motivate your team? Do you have a wooden stick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, by my words. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think Monica probably knows what I'm talking about. Monica can be really harsh. Yeah. We can say it. sometimes we scared of it's scared about it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Mediterranean skill. Yeah. We had, we had Biden before. I don't know if you know Biden or if you knew Biden. But Biden was from Lithuania as well, and she was like that. So it's a skill. It's, it's a Lithuanian so skill. Like let's <laughs> let's I, just. Yeah, I try to be gentle. <laughs> so Lithuanian cold. Like, <laughs> uh, it's just, they just have to look. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions coming from? Uh, no, I haven't seen any. There aren't anything. Any, nobody's really asking anything yet. Um, but so, I, so think, I would say, guys, yeah. thanks a lot for being here. Thanks a lot for taking the time, for being so patient with us. Amazing t shirts, by the way. Yeah, I don't know really. if people oh, notice that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could join us by the fire. Yeah, I wish you could join us by the fire and just, you know, like, it's, uh, you cannot hear it, but it goes like crackling. crackling you know? uh, Guys, I feel like we are in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's right. <laughs> I want to wish you Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Thanks a lot for doing this. We're just going to take a five minutes break 
and we're going to come back with the next speaker. Jason, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna queue them up. Um, you all just stay there for a moment, and we'll say goodbye to don't you. Don't go anywhere. Uh, so that we can we're see gonna it. we're gonna switch away for a minute. Everybody, don't go anywhere. Go to the bathroom. Grab a beer, an eggnog, a candy cane, whatever you have laying around. A turkey sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we'll be back in a five minutes or so. Okay. So, Thank you. Just, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.
back. back. You see, we don't lie. We were back soon. How's the sound? Is it is it good now? Is the it's sound better? Too, too low, too high. Let us, Let know, us if know if the sound is okay. If it's acceptable. Also, again, uh, I'm going to put my jumper after the three days up for sale. <laughs> All you have to do is to hit the like button, and then you'll enter a chance to win my own sweater, which is already on a on a good track to be very smelly by the end of these three days. Jason, so should we introduce the second and last speaker for today? Yes, let's do that. I think that's a fantastic idea. That's a it's great idea. As a matter of fact, it's a spectacular idea. Ho, ho, ho! It's a <laughs> holiday time spectacular <laughs> idea. <laughs> you, Since bump you guys bellies? didn't see that detail, did you? Yeah, the holiday spe It's even <laughs> written on the shirt. So in case we forget. Um, yeah, so, so somebody said, some people said this sounds good. Some people said it's a bit low. Um, let's see if I can bump that up a little bit i would um, say that the sound it is what it is it's it's loud when fabio talks <laughs> and <laughs> it's not loud when <laughs> jason talks okay we cannot modify that okay um now let's go ahead and ready let's to introduce let's the next bring speaker? on the next speaker let's do that all right let's cut to him good evening mr mark <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us tonight the one and only Mike Golden. Too very kind. Too very kind. Mike. Hello. How are you? How are, how's it going? Happy it's holidays. It's going good. Oh, a happy holiday time spectacular to you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> We're very excited to see what you have prepared for tonight. I mean, I am too, if I'm being honest. I mean, I feel like I took on kind of a big topic here. And then I put this whole thing together in like the last day and a half. So, you know, it's going to be a it's going to be a surprise for all of us. I think. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> Our stock price just went straight I mean, down. It's a live stream, right? Like, you know, right. this isn't how I typically roll. Typically, I'm done way in advance, way, 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 way in advance. But uh, it's a live stream. So we just wing it, right? We That's just right. Kinda... Exactly. It's not fun unless you do that. Exactly. It's a different set of rules, I think. And also, if we were to do everything correct and without any mistakes and without any, uh, you know, problems, it wouldn't be original. I will guarantee you I'm going to make sure that people know that it's live while this presentation <laughs> is going on. There will be problems. Right okay, now I have good. words across my face. <laughs> so get ready, folks. This is what we're doing today. Happy holidays, 2020. Come on. Mike. <laughs> The the floor is yours. Enjoy. Give it up for Mike Golden. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so give 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 us a moment to like get you properly situated on the screen. And you do you, what you gotta do. I'm gonna mute our. I'm, I'm gonna mute us. myself. I'm gonna mute and us. I'm ready now. to roll. I'm gonna mute us. So if you have a problem, just uh, we'll be listening. So just let us know, okay? I'll I'll I'll. All right. Um, I assume that means I'm good. Uh, guys, what's going on? Welcome. Happy, uh, whatever day it is. Let's get started, shall we? I'm pretty sure I had a way to, uh, start this thing, but like I said, we're just gonna roll with this thing. We're gonna talk about great work today. Um, I think that great work, it's been on my mind a lot, and, uh, I feel like it's kind of on all of our mind. We all want to do great work. I think that's probably universal, at least for this wonderful audience, right? We all want to do great work. We kind of throw the term around uh, a little bit willy-nilly, like uh, Mona Lisa, that thing's great. Thomas Dubois' last painting, also great. We don't really know what it means. We kind of, it's a, it's a catch-all. Uh, and I think that probably a lot of us as artists kind of look at these artists that we idolize or revere, and we kind of think, I'll never get there. I'll never be able to do work like fill in the blank for yourself. So today we're gonna kind of talk about these things. That's the plan. All right. Um, supposed to introduce myself. We got things beeping. So rule number one of doing great work is uh, do not disturb. 
got it done. Um, I should introduce myself. We're going to keep it quick because we've got a lot to talk about. And I'm going to try and stand over here. We'll see how that goes. Um, my name is Mike. Uh, I run a studio called Three Marks, which is just me. So I am Three Marks. One Mike, Three Marks. Um, I do a lot of work that looks like this. In my free time, I do droki. Excuse me. Uh, that little beer. You know, it's a Friday to me. Um, I do a lot of work that looks like this. If you like fantasy, sketchy, 3D drawing stuff, droki's for you. Which way? That way. One way or the other. That's me. Okay. Did we do a quick uh, introduction? I think we did. Uh, the last time I had the uh, pleasure of talking at uh, the D2 uh, was not um, this picture. Boop. That was at Maddie. Another city that starts with a V, Venice, Vienna. People I love, places I love being, and I'm very fortunate to be at, so we'll fix it. Eh, kind of. But bear with me for a moment. The last time I had the pleasure of talking at uh, either place, to be honest, uh, I was talking about a lot of client work. Um, specifically... Not even so much the work, I was talking about how to present, how to approach your clients, manage your clients. And I talked a lot about my process, which looks kind of like this. The first time a client sees an image, looks something like that. And the next time it's like that, and then we're done. One round of review. I have found that it's typically a pretty small round of review, and it's awesome. Uh, in that conversation, every time I presented this, I start with kind of a list of some sort or caveat, and I know that this runs off the whole screen all the way over there, it doesn't matter. There's only one thing that's important, is that I generally start by saying, do great work. That's the first step, right? Uh, doing great work, or at least very good work, is in a lot of ways in this business necessary, but not sufficient, right? You have to be doing good work to have your projects run smoothly, to have your clients come back. It's a competitive industry. You have to be doing good work, and then everything else is bonus. Some of these screens on here are, are, are mirrored, which makes this really easy, and other ones aren't, which makes it really hard. But we're gonna be all over the place today. But, like I was saying, first one on the list, first thing to do, do great work. And then everything after that assumes that you're doing at least good work. What is great work? We're gonna ask ourselves that question. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, how do we do great work? And specifically, um, how do we define great work? Because how else are we going to do anything? I thought that was going to move. That's how you do it. There we go. That's where it's supposed to be all the time. Um, how do we define great work, right? We can't start thinking about how we do great work unless we have some target, right? What is the goal that we're trying to reach? How are we going to define it for ourselves necessarily or for the industry as, as a whole? Is it possible? These are the questions. I hope some of you have read uh, the book by Jim Collins called From Good to Great. It's a wonderful book. It's about business, um, like traded on the stock company, stock market type of businesses. And it's been fantastic. Highly recommend it. He defines uh, a great company, talking about how companies go from good to great, as a company that achieves financial performance, several multiples better than the market average, and importantly, over a sustained period. That's an important part, right? So doing work that's better than average across time. That seems like a pretty good definition. And for talking about companies, it seems like a great, um, great definition. Excuse me, lost my train of thought. We're not talking about how to make a great arc biz company though. I think that uh, probably everybody watching, and at least for me personally, if I had the option of doing mediocre work and making a lot of money more than the average or the option of doing uh, about average money-wise, but doing amazing, mind-blowing work, that's the one I'm choosing. I think most of us in this industry feel that way. That's why we got into it, right? And now if we're going to have both, hey, everything's gravy. But I think that when we're talking about great work, we're not talking about a great company necessarily, except insofar as that allows great work as in images and films and all the fun things that we make happen. Um, so that's not super duper helpful, uh, but we could look at it from our client's perspective. I'm doing terrible at standing in my spot. I need a circle. Um, we could look at our clients, right? If you have happy clients, you probably did at least good work. You did at least above average. 
I think we can safely say, good is an easier one to define than great. Good is above average, right? Average, mediocre, run of the mill, good. Anywhere above that, you're in the good category. I think if you have ecstatic clients, the type of clients that, you know, don't ask for changes, let you put more fog in the scene, all those kind of fun things, do vignettes, you probably did great work. You probably managed them really well too. Um, and your business is probably on the great side of the arc of his business, businesses. Um, but clients change, right? And what they want varies from client to client, from project to project. Again, we don't get a target of what great work is. Uh, if a firm went out looking for a very moody image and got a very clean one, they'd be disappointed, even if it was a great clean image and vice versa, right? And a lot of these companies that we hire or that hire us, whether they be architects or developers, they have a style that they're looking for, right? Which makes firms that we may put all on the same great level in a very different hierarchy. So that's not particularly helpful. We could look to um, our industry, our peers. These are the nominees and the winner from this year's CG Architect Awards. Um, we could look to you know what our industry basically says is the best work being produced right now. And I've had the honor of judging these two years in a row. And I can tell you from you know behind the scenes, it's it's never clear cut, right? Like the the you know there's a vast agreement on the the best group of maybe 30, 40 images. And then depending on what judges are present that year and how many judges and everything else, this changes, right? You could pick a different set of judges and you would get an equally valid but completely different top five, in my opinion. Same for, oh wait, these three guys though, they were finalists last two years. And Pedro, oops, that guy from Arky 9, he's won the last two years. So we could just ask them, but uh, I didn't. So we're gonna carry on. Um, when we did the Hugh Ferris challenge with my good friends at the D2, um, what, a month or two ago, uh, me and Mengi were the two judges on top of Jason and Fabio. Mengi and I generally agreed on like the top 25, but our top 10 had zero similarities, zero. Which is to say, we still don't have a definition of great, right? From person to person, it is so incredibly um, subjective, right? And what we think is great that day, that year, depending on how we're evaluating a thing, great is very, very tough. Most of these slides that have the little asterisks down here, whoop, right there, means I'm supposed to say something. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say right now. So this is a little, a little surprise. Oh, you kind of said it. We kind of have a general sense that we just know greatness when we see it, right? And we all kind of agree. By and large, I think that we look at work and we say, that's great. And everyone says, yeah, that's great. And everyone kind of agrees. We kind of all, we all have a sense. It's hard to define, hard to pinpoint. We all kind of a sense. Eh, sometimes. There, we see disagreements, right? And we see it in all the creative industries. Um, if you look at Peter Lick, I'm not gonna say anything more about Peter Lick because this is live and we're not trying to make any enemies, but uh, do some research. Great is at best quasi subjective and, and at worst it's downright contradictory, right? Um, I think that that's kind of a given depending on who you're asking, what they're evaluating it on. You gotta do a re little refresher. I should have had a little mid roll thing to, to go with refresher. Um, but I don't think that we can count on just like the industry standards. I don't think that we can count on our clients. I don't think that we can look at some quantitative metric like how much money someone makes or how many images they make or don't make or clients. That's all I think not within the realm of great work in the artistic sense, right? Um, again, now these asterisks, they're really, they're really starting, to, starting to kind of scare me because I know I'm supposed to say something, but I don't know what it is. I'm supposed to say something about Instagram. It probably knew that I had forgotten, and just as I had forgotten about it, gave me the little old reminder, which is in the top corner now instead of the bottom. We all know this, we don't know why. We kind of know why, they're trying to sell us more stuff. Um, did you all get that little dopamine hit? I feel like I should have a pop-up 
on my computer throughout the day that just randomly throws one of these guys onto my screen so that I feel good for that little microsecond and I can feed the addiction, keep moving along. We all love likes. We're also kind of powerless against this, right? They're doing studies on hundreds of millions of people with A-B testing on how to keep you addicted to it. It's a problem because we keep looking at it and then we look at something like this. These are two images that I made recently. Oops, back to your spot, Michael. Uh, these are two images that I made recently on Droki. We're going to look be looking at mostly just kind of random personal stuff I've done today. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. We'll see. It's a surprise. Um, we can look at this. We got uh, 201 likes on the left, 633 on the right. These were only separated by a couple of days, uh, maybe a week. So what do we, what do we, what do we kind of... Our emotional side on how we look at this, we say, okay, image on the right must be way better than image on the left because a lot more people gave me my little my little dopamine fix, right? We all got it, it's, it's there. Um, and maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe the image on the right is, oops, how do I get, the, how, oh, can't get the quotes in here. You know, you guys know what I'm trying to do. It, maybe it is better, who knows? Um, but. Instagram just kind of, it's, it's hardwired into, into our, our little part of the brain to, to feel that way. I should do more stuff like the one on the right because it's better. People have told me so. The arbiter of the masses have told me so. Um, well, I mean, this number's got to matter, right? The image on the right got seen by 7,300 people. The image on the left got seen by 1,200. Does Instagram know which image is better? Is it because the elections and hashtags were dropped? Is it about who shared this? No idea. Absolutely, there's no way to reason it out. There's absolutely nothing to be gained from trying to figure out why someone liked my sketch on the left less than my sketch on the right. That's all it is. I only bring this up because I get a lot of people talking to me about how their likes and they get disappointed when they don't have as many followers as artist X who they don't think is as good as them or whatever else it is. Instagram is its own thing. We cannot base our artistic or personal worth on how these things are doing. We don't understand how it's doing. We never will. It changes, right? Okay, that was a little bit of a rant. I think I said the things I had to say. We might, we might come back to that because it's, it's, it's a thing. Um, but what I'm, what I'm going to say is, is, is great work is, is hard to define, right? We have yet to come up with a good solution of defining great work. And you guys are probably saying, Mike, you've been talking for, I don't know how long I've been talking. Um, what are we trying to get to? Well, I think that we can, we can agree on good work being easier to find. It's above average. And I like to define good work, and I encourage you to define good work as good work that you're excited about when you make it. Very specifically, when you make it. For me, and I'm not talking like, oh, I did a thing and I'm happy. I think here's what I'm addicted to within Archivist, and, and hopefully this resonates true. I haven't talked a ton, I think, about this. Um, but maybe I have. Either way, hopefully this rings true with you. The thing that I love about ArcViz, about making images, about sketching, about you know lowercase art or however we want to call this these things that we're creating, is when I finish an image and I feel like I made something that when I started that image I didn't think I could make. That's what I'm addicted to. That's what gets me excited. And sometimes that's a technical thing, a new piece of software, a new technique. Sometimes it's an artistic thing. As far as communication goes, there's a million things that can that can give me that excitement, but that is what I'm after. In my professional work and in my personal work, I want that feeling of, I just did something that a week ago, I didn't think I could make, didn't think I could do. So that's how I'm defined excited and that's how I define good work. It doesn't help us still with great work. We're gonna keep coming back to this. We're not going to get a def, spoiler, I should have put, spoiler. Look, now we got the full screen. I could have done the spoiler alert thing. What can you say? Um, we're not going to get a good definition of great work. I'll tell you right now. You guys probably, you're a smart bunch. You probably already saw that coming. Uh, it doesn't help us to find great work, but I do think it helps us to find how to do great work. And I'm going to say that doing great work is doing good work consistently over time. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, explain some things on this one, right? This, it seems really simple, 
Mike, what have you told us? You've told us uh, to do do work you're happy with. It's bigger than that. I, I think it's bigger than that. So this, is a, this is a key point. It's an important one, I think, is that um, here is, I don't know, 30, 30 some odd images from Droki. My personal account has existed for like three years or, or thereabouts. And this is like 30 images, kind of picked at random. And they're on a ranking, a very scientific, heavily debated ranking between should I be going back to law school and I think I'm the next dimension. It's all about how I feel about the image personally. And they're all kind of sitting right above the old meh, whatever level, right on the eye line, right? And I think this is pretty accurate as far as how I felt when I made the image. You might be wondering why there's nothing below meh because Mike Golden doesn't do anything below average. Very false. I just don't post that stuff. If I post it, by the mere fact that I post it, I kind of say, yeah, I like this at least a little bit, right? And I'm, I'm kind of proud of this. Maybe I'll just put a little feeler out, right? Every time we post it, there's, there's a moment of that there. And so we're gonna get back to these question marks a little bit later. Um, but this is how I felt about each one of these images when I posted them. The images, whoops, way over here, three years ago or so, meh, I was pretty excited when I posted them. The images now, I think are way better. I think I've improved, that's always a good sign. I wouldn't say I'm more excited though, right? My standards keep changing. And so my feeling is kind of constant, but it's all above meh, that's important. Here's kind of my conceptual, if I rank these images now. And that's the important thing, right? Is that every time you make a better image, you kind of raise your own little standards. And so if you're in constant pursuit of trying to impress yourself, that means you're gonna be growing. You're learning new techniques, new skills, new ways to make an image, new ways to communicate. And this is important, right? Because that's an upward trend. And somewhere, we don't, know, we don't know what makes an image great or film great or whatever your motion graphic great, but we know it's, we know it's this direction, right? It's up, it's up here somewhere. And so if we just do this long enough, at some point, we'll make something that someone will think is great. Um, here is image three. This is the third image I made in Strokey. Whoops, that's a little bit tougher with the, with the thing in my hand. And then the image I made from a couple of months ago, right? Kind of the same idea. I do like the rock people. Maybe because I don't know how to do people in 3D well. I like the rock people. I'm sticking with I like them. Uh, vast difference, in my opinion. Some of you guys might look at them and say, yeah, they're about the same. For me, the image on the right, way better than the image on the left. And that was a few months ago. So I'm still, I'm already kind of starting to, starting to wean a little on that one. Um, this is Sparth. He's in my spot, but I'm gonna let him be in my spot because, because it's Sparth and I, Sparth is one of my heroes. He is a concept artist. He is the lead designer for Halo, has been for years and years and years. Uh, this, whoops, we're gonna keep doing that all day long. This is what about two hours of his time gives you. It's amazing. I think that the, I, I have long been a, kind of obsessed with the efficiency and communication of speed painters. It's a skill I've wanted long time, long, long time. Um, I've had a couple different bouts of like, I'm gonna learn that thing. I'm gonna learn how to, I'm gonna learn how to do speed painting. I'm not gonna be sparth right away, but like, you know, I'll, I'll get there. <clears throat> this is embarrassing. For, uh, I'm embarrassing myself for, for Fabio and Jason's likes. So like for embarrassing artwork, warning, we're gonna, we're gonna plow through this thing. This was like three years ago. Um, hadn't really ever painted anything. Um, I was trying to learn. It uh, probably took me half an hour and uh, looks like my daughter did it. It's pretty bad, Let, let's just call it what it is. It's bad. You do get a little bit of depth. I'm painting the Z depth. I kind of learned that from somebody. Um, but it's not Sparth. It's not Sparth at all. Um, and at the time, I was very much comparing myself to Sparth. Not because I thought that 
I would just sit down and be able to do this kind of work, but because that's the kind of work I wanted to do. And so I was looking at what I was making, image on the right, in case you know, it's not painfully obvious. Uh, and I was wanting to make images like the one on the left. Um, there's, there's no reasoning that, uh, the, you know, you're not gonna look at these two image, those two images and say to yourself, yeah, you just gotta learn this and that and you're almost there, buddy. The, the divide between these images is, is almost unfathomable of the number of things that need to be learned. But uh, that's what I was doing. And, and to be fair, uh, the image on the, on the left here, Sparth's image, again, just to clarify for anybody that might be confused, um, it did take him like a little over two hours. So, you know, had I gotten another hour and a half on that one? Well, no, probably not. Um, because this is what it looked like after 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, nowhere near that either. Now, the reason that I know what that looks like uh, is because uh, you can buy the tutorial. It's like $4 on Gumroad. And it's a live, uh, in real time, uh, screen capture of him painting that piece. And he goes through and talks about what he's doing, how he's doing it. You can look at the techniques he's using. You can hear him talk about why he's doing the things he's doing. It's an amazing resource, right? Like never in the history of, of time has a young artist been able to say, I admire the hell out of this best in class artist, whichever concept art, arc viz, VFX, storytelling, whatever it is, I wanna learn how to write like Neil Gaiman. I can do that. That is insane, right? Um, so you would think that that would be really inspiring for all of us. Um, and it is, and there's a lot to learn there. Uh, but it also causes you to kind of say, give you the old AB. And uh, if I was comparing all of my work to my heroes, the people I want to be more like, uh, this is how I would feel when I make things, right? Uh, or more, more accurately, probably more like this. Because that little kick you get from making something you didn't think you could make, that excitement that, that I find in what I'm gonna call good work, that's what propels you to the next image, to try more. You got momentum. Down here, you're comparing yourself to people way out of your class, like old Mikey versus Sparth. Yeah, it, it, you're not gonna make it up. And um, that image before, the bad one, I did that for like two weeks. I, I kept up like a daily practice routine. And uh, like so many other attempts to practice in the past, uh, we failed that one. I'm nothing if not stubborn, however. It's gonna come back. Just, you, you, we gotta wait for it. No idea how I'm doing on time. Um, if it's a problem at any point, I assume someone will interrupt me. Um, but I think, I, I, think we're, I think we're doing all right. I think we're doing okay. Um, here's, here's the thing. You have a ton to be able to learn from your heroes. And that's an amazing opportunity that we have right now. And we just need to be careful of, of how we're thinking about it, I think. Um, and I think this is important. Oh, oh, now see, this was one of the technical things that I we had to make you guys wait a little bit longer for during the interlude because uh, I don't know how to use OBS. But just like that, we're back in it. Problem solvers all across the board. Um, don't confuse them with your teachers. We're gonna get into this. You guys have all probably heard about the 10,000 hour rule. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell made it famous, you know, practice something for 10,000 hours, you're gonna be an expert, you're gonna be a professional. You wanna be the Beatles? Just 10,000 hours of practice and you can be the next Beatles. No shit. He based all of that research, he came up with the 10,000, uh, oops, Mike, back to your spot. Um, he came up with that all from, from this guy. Anders Ericsson. And uh, that's, how, that's how he feels about the 10,000 hour rule. Does it take a lot of practice to become an expert, a pro, a master of anything? Yes, but it varies. And practice, practice alone mm, can be meaningless. We're gonna explain. Um, uh, no, we're supposed to explain on that slide apparently. Um, Anders Ericsson, we're getting, we're getting ourselves back around. I should take a sip when I need to think. 
that's how we're going to do this. Um, Anders Ericsson kind of breaks up practice into three categories. Um, one is deliberate, which is, um, oh, am I going to forget all the words? This is why you're supposed to leave notes for yourself. Um, deliberate practice, which is basically getting feedback from a coach, from a teacher, from someone who knows more than you and can give you feedback on your work. Um, what's the other one? Deliberate practice. There's two good ones and one bad one. No, we're going to call it focused practice. That's not the right word. You guys can look it up. It's easy to find. Um, and actually, that might be deliberate practice. But you basically have practice where you have a coach or a mentor or someone who knows more than you at the time giving you feedback on how to improve in one way or another. Um, like conscious practice, which I am calling, I can't remember the words right now, um, is sitting down and focusing. So this isn't necessarily guided by somebody, but if you're trying to, let's say, learn the guitar, this will be practicing your scales. This would be sitting down and trying to figure out how to play something you can't play. That's got to be the deliberate focus one. We're going to call that deliberate practice. Um, and just, you know, yeah, you guys get the point. Um, sitting down and working on a thing, specifically focusing all of your attention on that thing to make it better. And then you have naive practice. In the guitar example, that's picking up a guitar and playing a song. It's not bad for you, but it's not practice as he defines it. We're never gonna get that figured out. That's just not gonna work. Um, and so 10,000 hours of practice, it depends. It has to be a certain kind of practice. And it's worth noting that the best experts, experts in the field that have been studied on their ability to do that kind of practice max out like four or five hours a day as the most that they can maintain that amount of single-minded focus on one thing. And typically for only like 60 to maybe 90 minute um, chunks. And that's a skill in and of itself, being able to focus like that. And so if we have this idea of, well, I'm just gonna you know, put in 10 hours a day and I'm gonna be at this thing in no time, it, you can't do it. You can't do the right kind of practice. Moving forward, we're also gonna separate two things when it comes to practice. We are gonna separate uh, hard skills and soft skills. 3DS or YouTube has an amazing resource of how to do any tips and tricks. You'll notice there's no tips and tricks yet. And uh, again, spoiler alert, there's not going to be any tips and tricks today. Um, not as far as technical ones anyways. And there's a lot of great resources for this. And to some degree, like this is relatively easy to learn. It's relatively easy to learn how to use the curves tool in Photoshop or Photoshop offers a new content creation tool. Okay, you do this, this, and this, give it one try, you kind of got it, you can move on. Soft skills in our industry, composition, lighting, pacing, um, mood, storytelling, colors, all of these things, eh, there's not like a, oh, I learned it, I can check it off, I can move on to the next, right? These are skills that don't have a defined level, they're much harder to learn, right? And this is, I think, where um, mentors or teachers or we're going to stick with teachers come into play. Um, oh, getting the things confused. Uh, I'm going to play a little thing. Well, it looks like that. But first, we're going to look at it like this. Uh, this is a paint over that I did for Nicholas Boyson. Um, on uh, Wartime Optimism when I was streaming every day on uh, YouTube. And it took me about 30 minutes, painted it through, and it was the advice of here's how, what I would do with that image. For better or for worse, you can agree with it or disagree with it. This is what I would do with that image. And I think we've probably seen that loop enough. Yes, we've seen that loop enough. Here was the original one um, by Nicholas up top. Great looking image. He was nominated for a Rookies Award. I meant to check to see how that turned out. I don't know, but congratulations to Nicholas. Thank you for sending me the image. Um, and the bottom one is my version. Not a ton of changes, little changes. Um, in my personal opinion, in my subjective opinion, I like mine better. Nicholas might like his better. I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, but here's the thing. There's nothing that I did from a technical standpoint of using a depth map using curves, painting some like really loose, soft 
masks in, there's nothing technically challenging about the decisions that I made. It was thinking about where to do them, how to do them uh, to get an effect in the final image, which is to focus the viewer more down into this building. So that was the goal at least. Um, those are hard things to learn. And I don't think there's not a course that I know of. Um, and I don't know what that course would look like if it exists. It's a slow kind of, oh, you see someone else do it for you. I can, I'll do it again later, right? And it's just the slow repetition. What I did in this image or what someone else would do in this image is different from what they would do in another one. There's no rules at this point, right? Composition rules, eh, they don't do much for you, especially when it comes to specific cases. So um, the video got me a little discombobulated. These two lovely noir looking gents um, are two of my teachers uh, that I was very lucky to kind of happen upon, um, which was uh, an incredibly uh, lucky and fortunate event in my life. Uh, we have Matthew Bannister, for anyone who doesn't know, the founder of D-Box. We have Keith Bowley, um, the one of the senior partners also. I don't know what his title is anymore. This is what it is on the website. He was, when I was there at least, he was a very hands-on on the creative side on the actual production side. Um, I'm going to tell two of those stories because, it's, it, like I said, it's just as hard to explain, I think, or at least for me, to explain what I'm talking about with learning these soft skills as it is to actually learn them. Or maybe not as hard, but you get the idea. So I'm going to tell two little stories um, that I hope will maybe um, bring out a little bit more of, of an explanation. This is an image that uh, Matthew and I specifically worked on I don't, I don't know the years, a while ago. This is for One Madison. And this is for specifically an ad campaign that, uh, that had been brought to D-Box. And I can remember before we had an idea for this project or whatever else, and I was still relatively young and in, young into my career for sure. And I'd been at D-Box for maybe a year. Uh, Matthew asked if I wanted to come with him to One Madison, which had been built already but was you know, unfinished on the inside, to think about ideas. And we went and we walked around the empty shell of a building, uh, thinking about what we could do for an ad. I say, we were thinking about what we could do for an ad. Let's be honest here. Matthew was doing a lot of thinking. I was kind of listening and trying to sound like I understood it all. I think would be a, a, a good way to explain it and uh, probably the accurate way to explain it. And after that, you know, we walked around. Got to get those quotes in. We, in quotes, uh, had an idea. We went back to the office and Matthew kind of laid out some of these ideas that he was having and said, OK, here's what we're going to try. Why don't you mock up a few things? And I mocked up a few ideas, kind of understanding what he was getting at. Really quickly, he came over and looked at them when we sat down with those rough compositions, just kind of very loosely masked in, in 3ds Max. And again, Matthew kind of looked through them all and said, oh, why don't we try maybe this? And why don't we try maybe that? And why don't we try, you know, maybe if we, maybe if we. Um, and I did all of those. And, uh, you know, eventually we came to this image, uh, which we then had to shoot. And like every one of these reflections was captured in the same frame. So it was a very complex photo shoot for uh, this set of images. And at no point did Matthew teach me, here's how you come up with an ad, because how do you teach that? or here's how you compose a shot like this. There were no like tips and tricks and there's no like lesson that I can instill upon you as much as I wish that I could, except that I got to watch from beginning to end because of the generosity of his time, how he was thinking through this process, how someone with a lot more experience um, and a lot more wisdom when it comes to these types of things works through a problem like this. I understood most of it, right? I followed along, we made the image, we're, I'm still very happy. I don't want to speak for Matthew, but I hope that he is too. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite images that I made while I was at D-Box. And the thing that I learned from it, how to think, how to work through a problem, how to see things. Let's go to a second story. Um, Keith Bowman. This image was done for Grimshaw in the north of uh, New York. Um, this image um, we've been working on for a little while. I was doing all of the Photoshop on it. 
it didn't look like this. I don't have the rough, unfortunately, to show you. I wish I did. Um, I had been, I had spent like a day and a half in Photoshop, change the sky, change the color of the green, change the color of the yellow, change how bright the fins are, change how dark the fins are. Maybe we need more vignetting. Maybe we need less vignetting. I kind of was just sitting there and doing one of the old, as to like what to do to make this image right. Keith came over, looked at it, goes up, glanced at it, sat down, couple curves, couple masks, about 10 minutes, finished, right? Didn't do anything technical that was uh, beyond my ability to grasp from a technical standpoint, but how he could see that those were the things that needed to be done completely and utterly beyond me, right? He talked through what, what he was seeing, how it was, but a lot of it's like, he cropped in the image from the right, like, well, why'd you do that? It feels right, it feels better. Okay, so Keith goes home, I sat in the office, click on, click off, click on, click off. Just like going back and forth, trying to identify what it was that he saw in that image. And here's what I came away with it. He saw a better image in it than I did. He saw where it could go. And I sat there and I redid all of the steps that he did. And I did it on this image and I did it on other images that I worked on him with, uh, worked with him on. And I did it over and over and over again until I started like little by little developing an eye for the types of things that they were looking for that's very hard to put a word to, the soft skills of composition or lighting or color, right? Repetition. He did this, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna rebuild those six layers myself to see each one as I do it. And that like, there's a tenacity there, which I guess is bragging. And I guess I'm okay with, with, with that bragging, that like a stubbornness of I will understand this. And I think that that's very important when it comes to where you hit roadblocks because you're gonna hit them where you can't seem to get past a certain thing. Um, you need to keep fighting it until you get past it. Otherwise you just, you stay on the, on the wrong side of it forever. Um, I hope those stories helped a little bit in trying to explain it. Soft skills are hard. I think you need people that are willing to put in the time and energy to explain something that's hard to explain to you. Um, if you don't have one of those, you need to find one. I don't have advice on how to do that. Um, but I think it's very, very important. It's one of the things uh, that Anders talks about in meaningful practice is getting feedback from someone who knows more than you. So if you have that person, thank them. If you don't have that person, start looking for them. It is not an easy job. It takes a lot of time and effort with not much on the reward side for them. Um, so thank them. And so I don't know how eloquent that was, but that is also a thank you uh, to Keith and Matthew and all of the other people that uh, taught me a ton of things, especially while I was starting. Okay. I think we're starting to wrap up here. I'm not sure how we're doing, but I, I, I think we're doing okay. It's very hard talking to a camera. <sighs> We still got 70 likes. Maybe we'll get a few more likes and, uh, and that'll make me think that this is going okay. We got, we got a few more things. Um, this, is, this is a thing that uh, if, I could, if I could go back to, to Mike from 10 years ago, if I could go back to Mike from 10 years ago, this, this would be the one thing that uh, I wish I had figured out, which is make a habit of practice. Um, think of it like getting in shape. If your goal is to get in shape, whatever that definition means for you, that doesn't mean on the second Thursday of every month, you go and spend nine hours at the gym. You're just gonna hurt yourself. And uh, you know, you'll probably stop doing that pretty quick. Little bits, right? Little bits of sustained practice. Um, when I wake up in the morning and I come into my office, this is generally what, you know, once I turn the screens on, what I see, all the applications, whoops, Mike, your spot, your spot. I told myself, stay in the spot, your spot's over here. I made the whole presentation with the spot being here. Put the screen here. Whew, we'll continue. We will push for, through this, guys. Um, this is what my desk looks like. Uh, basically every morning. If it doesn't look like this, it probably was a pretty tough night uh, work-wise, but everything on my computer is closed as far as whatever I was working on yesterday, internet, browsers, mail clients, chat clients, everything's closed with the exception of 
whatever I'm going to be doing first thing in the morning for between 30 minutes and an hour. I succeed about five out of seven days a week. Um, but I've already thought about what I'm going to do. I have a plan in place from, you know, the night before, which is in, the, in this particular example, I'm going to paint rocks. Literally, that's what I was doing that morning. I was painting rocks. So I had pure rep open with some rocks that I was going to try and paint. I had Photoshop open and ready and the Cintiq pulled out in front of the desk and water and, you know, coffee, right? That's how I start my day. Emails, I put in 30 minutes. I can fit in 30 minutes every morning. The only goal there, the goal is not to make anything that I'm going to post. The goal is not even to do good work that we've been talking about all of this time. The goal is 30 minutes, deliberate, focused practice, which means if there's music, there's no words. So maybe classical. I like Brain FM a lot. Uh, no email, no web browsers, no podcasts, no YouTube. Basically silence and work. 30 minutes, just trying to, in this case, just draw rocks. And success on that story, if I made it, made it to 30 minutes, successful day. Cross it off the checklist for the day, put it away, get back into whatever I'm working on, you know, to actually pay the bills. This is how I start. I wish I had started this 10 years ago. Uh, I've been doing it for about a year. Let's look at what that's done. Let's, uh, let's see what practice has gotten. This is the beginning. Oops, where, where are we? We just did the whole little talk, the pep talk about the uh, spot. This is where we, what we were looking at before. Pretty embarrassing, I know. Uh, this was about after, you know, three weeks of daily practice. Whoa. Whoa. Hello. We're getting out of control over here. Uh, the bottom image is what it looks like after um, three weeks of, of I'm not gonna call it deliberate practice. I had music on, I didn't really have a thing that I was specifically trying to do. I was just sitting down and drawing something for 30 minutes every day. Eh, I'm not gonna say that we, we, we're seeing some results that we can really get behind, we can get excited about in, in this. Uh, this was two or three years ago, like I said, um, last the best in a month. Uh, the image on the left that you're looking at is about a year ago almost exactly a year ago, it is a, a thumbnail that I wanted to look good. Can you guys see me right now? Where's my screen? I wanted this image to look good. You can't see me right now. I really did. It gets a compositional idea across. I turned that into a 3D image. I wanted the sketch to look good though. Um, the image on the right took less time than the image on the left, excuse me. And the way that I did it was pretty much the same, right? I sat down, music off, 30 minutes of sketching. Same kind of process, image on the left, image on the right. Image on the left is, uh, you know, a year ago. Image on the right was a couple weeks ago. I think that kind of speaks for itself. I hope it does. Uh, two more examples. This one, I've been wanting to, to, to paint in color, right? I'm, I'm, I fe I'm feeling pretty comfortable, you know, not sparse level comfortable, but I'm feeling pretty comfortable in black and white these days, at least for thumbnails, right? The idea of getting a composition across clearly. Color is a whole new challenge when it comes to that. Um, this image on the left, I spent like two hours on this, which is embarrassing to admit. Um, I spent like two hours on that. And uh, did it serve the purpose of being a composition study or a thumbnail for a 3D work? Yes, it did. Does it look like something that means anything to anybody else besides me? Probably not. A little bit of color and mood in there. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. It's not good. And it does not look like anybody, let alone someone who calls himself a professional artist. I do make images for a living, uh, would say that he made, not with two hours of time. Image on the right took me about 35 minutes. Um, pretty easy peasy on that one. And that was after, what, eight months? When did this pandemic start? However long ago the pandemic started, that's how much time has passed. Here's a more like concrete, ah, oh, your spot, Mike. I just want to look, I want to look down where the camera lens is. Okay, so we know for next time. We learn. Um, this image was made um, uh, two or three months ago. And it was made in about 30 minutes. 
and it was made specifically, I said, I'm going to practice um, painting thumbnails, which in general I'm comfortable with, right? In color, right? So that I could do composition and like some light and mood. We have like a light and mood. I mean, I guess that kind of comes across in this, but like you don't get a sense of light in the painting, I think at all. Um, I did my little morning practice routine, 30 minutes to an hour every day over the course of like 30 days, put in 20 hours of total practice. Uh, and this was the last image that I made. Um, I think I, I can barely recognize myself. I'm very happy about that. If, you, if, it's, if it's not coming through on camera, this is Mike excited seeing that change. And that was 20 hours, 20 hours of practice. Not all in one day, not all in a couple of days spread out. So that was just like an hour a day. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled about that. And it's not that, that's not what that, that's not that much time, excuse me, in my opinion. Um, which is to say, don't worry about the 10,000 hours. That number doesn't mean anything anyways. And don't get daunted by how much you have to learn. If I want to be Sparth, there's still a ton of things that I got to do. I don't want to be Sparth, but you get my point, right? Concept design. There's a whole bunch of the drawing actual buildings. All those, there's, there's a thousand skills that I need to, lo need to learn before I'd be like, even like, even, even comparable, let alone anywhere near his level. But can we pick those things up like little by little, relatively quickly? I would argue yes, right? 20 hours of time. Hopefully that comes through. Hopefully that comes through. The spot, I know, Pedro, I see it in the chat. I can't read the chat, but I see someone saying the spot. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, I think we're done. I'm sure I had a point. Not sure why that slides in there. I think that was a mistake. I think I was deciding between one of these two last images. I think that's why it's there. Again, same idea, next image. Um, I think I went a little bit long, not entirely sure. Uh, I did think ahead for those of you that kind of zoned out and I wouldn't blame you if you did. Uh, my, my too long didn't read version. Um, let's go through real quick. We'll, do real, we'll make this thing a, bit, a little bit longer. Uh, the only person you should be judging uh, yourself against is, is you from yesterday, right? If you're more often than not a little bit better than you yesterday, sky's the limit, right? That's upwards. Um, anything else is probably counterproductive. It's probably also the only thing that you can rely upon, your judgment, right? That's going to change, but it's going to be consistent to you over time. The market, your clients, your friends, people's work you admire, all those things, they all fluctuate. It does not help to compare yourself to them. It helps to learn. Look at what they're doing better than you when you're trying to figure out the things to practice, but don't do the comparison thing. Um, learn from your heroes, 100%. The amount of knowledge that we have at our fingertips is absolutely mind blowing. Learning the tips and tricks that are relatively easy to learn, that's important. Those are our tools. That's how we do this thing. You can't do it without it. Um, even though I did just watch uh, Ian McHugh, who's another one of my painting concept art heroes, uh, do, a, do a one hour painting. It was gorgeous. And I think the only thing he used in Photoshop as far as tools goes was a brush tool, a lasso tool, and uh, the multiply blend mode, maybe a hue saturation. No tips and tricks, just, just dude, dude, dude's awesome. Check out Ian McHugh. Um, but there's so much to learn. There's so, so very much to learn. Um, but let's be mindful of how we learn and what we're actually getting when we see a tutorial. We didn't get a teacher, we got some knowledge. A teacher is a different thing. A teacher is someone who's going to take time to know your work, to encourage you to do better, specifically in the ways that you could do better, that you need to do better. Right? Um, so find, appreciate, and uh, and mind your teachers. Uh, you might come to disagree with them at some point. That's okay, right? Over time, though, you got to go. Someone's messaging me. Not sure who. See, we didn't turn off all the internet things. Um, if it's not good with it, stick with it. Right, that's where we learn. It's an interesting thing that I think I was supposed to say earlier, which is that the flow state where you kind of get locked into a project and time seems to disappear and you're just, you're zoned in. The studies on flow put that, we really need to close that right now, don't we? We can't talk with this beeping in the ears. Um, the flow state exists, happens at the periphery of your abilities, right? Right at the edge. If you are trying to do something that's very simple to you, you're not going to get the flow state. If you're trying to get something that's so far and so hard, me trying to make a Sparth painting, 
not going to get in a flow state either. It's just, it's not achievable at that time, right? At that particular moment. Flow happens right at that cusp of, I can probably do this. I can probably figure this out, but I got to use all the things that I got, right? I got to give it 100%. That's where flow happens. And that's also the same place that growth happens, right? Because that's your edge that you want to keep pushing further and further. So when you hit those hard things that you can't figure out, you have to keep trying to figure them out. Very important. Um, practice should be a routine. I think we just talked about that uh, a little bit each day. Works wonders. Um, practice should be hard, right? Like um, the idea of practicing for five or six hours straight, literally nobody can do that. The best athletes in the, in the world can't do it. The best mental athletes, the people that num memorize, you know, a gazillion parts of pie, those people, small chunks, 90 minutes tops, usually more like an hour, 45 minutes. Um, and it's, you should barely be able to get through it, like a hard workout, I'm told. I, don't, I, I haven't been to a gym. Well, I'd like to blame the pandemic, but that just would not be honest. Not honest at all. But I'm told that's how working out in the gym is, when it's good. Think of, it, think of your practice the same way. It should be hard. Um, 10,000 hours. Eh, I think what I wrote there is probably about uh, what it is. Um, 20 hours of practice, deliberate practice. I think it would be hard not to see results. I've been doing it since eh, February, January, February. I started that kind of routine. Uh, you know, there's been some ups and downs in the regularity of it, but... I don't think that there's ever been 20 hours of practice, not getting things set up, not thinking about what I'm going to do, 20 hours of I'm going to draw rocks or whatever it might be. I don't think you could do 20 hours and not see results where you're like, huh, I'm going to stick with this thing. Things are changing. Things are changing. Um, and turn off the internet when you're working. Distractions, the, the entire internet is making money off of distracting you. They have a lot of resources to do so. You gotta find a way to keep yourself focused, whether that's in your professional work, in your, in your personal work, your personal growth, find a way to turn off the internet. It's terrible, but also, you know, follow Droki because uh, I need that sweet, sweet dopamine hit like as often as I can, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Um, I think that's all I got for you. I think this is the end. Um, I hope that that encourages you to go out to do uh, good work today and then do good work again the day after that and do good work day after day after day. And I think if you do do good work in this fashion over time, uh, I think that at some point you'll be doing great work, probably sooner than, uh, than you would expect, or maybe already. That's what I got for you guys. I think that's the end. I think I'm finished. I don't know what to do now. I think Jason and Fabio are going to come back. They might be napping. I'm sure they had a long night getting this whole thing set up. Hey, we're here. Don't worry. We're, we're oh, here. they're here. I would not have blamed you if you were napping. Now, actually, this was beautiful, I have to say. And we got a lot of yeah? positive comments. Yeah, people are really saying that this was motivational. It was inspirational. Oh, and that makes me so... It's, it's very strange giving that kind of talk for that length with like zero feedback. <laughs> that was a strange one. That was like during live streams, you usually can like read the chat and interact, but like this is like a presentation. It's just like, just assume, just assume people are, 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 are listening. I, I agree that people should follow Drokis, but I also <laughs> think that they should follow Fabio Palvelli and Jason Bergeron. <laughs> and the that's, that's JH Bergeron for, on Instagram. I tried to get you guys as many likes as I could. Every time I thought of it, I threw it in there for you. Can, uh, can we try to get to 100 likes? What do you think? I mean, I mean, we've been trying. Can we do it is the question. And I think that we can. I don't know how many people are in okay, the Okay, all you lurkers out there. We're at 77 likes. If you haven't liked already, likes. go ahead and hit that like you button. You, d you don't have to announce yourself. You don't have to say anything in the chat. Just a little, you know, doop. Give us, you know, hey, it's, it's the dopamine. Yeah, it's the don't... dopamine that we don't need, but we want. We don't care. Hit the dislike button. It's both. It's a. It's a like or a dislike. It's the same thing. It's a. It's an interaction. It's engagement. Seventy-seven likes. It's only 30, 31 and a half likes more, and then we're at a hundred. So my math is right. I also wanted to say cheers. Oh, cheers we, we grabbed man. a beer. Oh, yeah. Cheers. 
And cheers, cheers to guys. everyone. Oh, look at Fabio's can is actually green. So, oh, <laughs> wait, that's Fabio, amazing. you're ruining the <laughs> you're ruining the illusion. But, <laughs> but the 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 thing here it's real, like yeah, that's real. We don't we don't skimp. Pro <laughs> probably can't set a beer on it though. We don't skimp on the on the set, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you go check, if you're if you're following me, I, or if you're a friend with me on Facebook, you can see a couple behind the scenes images <laughs> of what it actually looks like in this room. So I'm sorry if I ruined it for you, but Mike, um, this listen, was a great talk, Mike. This was an amazing. Oh, talk. thank you, thank you very very much. I very much appreciate that. Really, I hope that people got something out of it. I I'm sure that they did. I want to thank you again for taking the time. Oh, yeah. thank you guys for having me. I didn't say that. I meant to say that. That was like first on the notes. <laughs> thank Fabio and Jason. And then I didn't. And, uh, <laughs> That's okay. We know you're My thankful. apologies. <laughs> we will try and be better tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but somebody will be. But thank you guys for having me. I'm it's, sure it's you'll be in pleasure. the comment section, though, the chat section. Right? I expect that I will. Okay. I, I'm That's usually good. there. That's kind of where <laughs> I hang out. Dude, if instead you and I don't talk again before Christmas... Merry Christmas to you, your family, your beautiful daughter, and your beautiful <laughs> dog. Of course, I, I include your wife in that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it like one of those things like you're like, okay, it's so a beautiful twice if I say beautiful wife. Yes. <laughs> you know, that could be understood in different exactly. ways. It would be a compliment, but is it the right kind of compliment? You never know. I, I don't uh, know. Merry, Merry That's Christmas my thing. to you too, Fabri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same same for me to the whole family. Um, I hope you have a relaxing uh, holiday time, as as I do I mean, for everyone just, just out there. Out, just hanging out at home, right? Everyone's just hanging out. That's at home. right. It's the best best. It's not going to be the most fun filled, but it's going to be kind of the best. It's going to be the lowest stress Christmas for all of us. Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to say that I saw something in the in the chat just now. Um, that I find pretty enlightening, you know, Tudor, uh, he's, you know, I guess he watched your whole talk and he didn't Ooh. learn anything from the talk apparently, but you did yeah. remind him of something that he doesn't have any beer in his fridge. That's what he said. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm counting that as a success. Right? I would also say that this is a good lesson that you've taught, uh, with your, with you, your presentation. So cheers. Switch off the internet. <laughs> start crack start with open the beer. A beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Fabio, are we gonna wrap it up? I think that's pretty good. We got some uh, more great speakers coming tomorrow and the next day. Uh, I think that this Mike, really, really... we're gonna say goodbye to everybody. So don't go anywhere. We're going. To... Are you gonna take me off the screen so I can I can sit down again finally? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, just just real quick, thank you again, and to everybody watching, uh, thank you guys very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I talk about this stuff on live streams like every Monday and Friday. If you have more questions or you want me to do a paint over, find me on Twitch. Droki is the way you find me, kind of anywhere. But uh, thank you for your attention. Happy holidays and be well. And be kind to one another. That's my thing. That's my thing. That's very much needed right now. <laughs> yeah, so take guys, care. Guys, thank you. Take care. Mike, don't go anywhere. Yeah, stay right here. I'll be here. Oh, I'm not okay. going anywhere. Okay. So, we are back. Jason, what do you think of this first on, day? In front of our roaring fire. and Our crackling fire? It's, is it crackling? <laughs> in our We're, we're going to put some chestnuts on there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. um, some potato wedges. But yeah, join us tomorrow to see if anything changes on the set. <laughs> it's very important. We're going to have two more speakers, and then the day after that, two more speakers, and then we're going to say goodbye to each other. But thanks a lot for hanging out tonight. It was a lot of fun for us. Very, yes. I had a great time. Yeah, and I, I'm, ha I'm glad that people enjoyed it. Um, yeah, like we said, there's gonna be some more great stuff to the next couple days, so yeah. Good night, everybody, and see you tomorrow. Bye.